I think, and I don't know if you experienced this, experience this as a newer physician, but I remember, especially as a newer grad, I'd be like, there's microscopic hematuria. Like I need to like deal with this right now. Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP and you are watching the Real World NP YouTube channel. We make weekly episodes to help save you time, frustration, and help you take the best care of your patients. In this week's episode, I interviewed Dr. Joseph Aquay. He is a urologist, and we sourced questions from the real world MP community about urology. The general theme being what you wish primary care providers knew, and then what we would like to ask you. So we talked about things like microscopic hematuria, BPH, incontinence, and um, erectile dysfunction. So many, so many different things, and things that he wishes we knew, and pet peeves and it was just it was so much fun so um i can't wait for you to watch or listen to this episode if you haven't already please do grab the ultimate resource guide for the new np head over to realworldnp.com guide you'll get these episodes sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me patient stories and bonuses i really just don't share anywhere else without further ado here is my interview thank you so much for being here can you introduce yourself all right, thank you for having me, first of all. My name is Dr. Joseph Okwey. Uh, I'm a urologist with uh, Wellstar at the Douglasville, Georgia location. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to uh, discuss some of the common urologic issues that probably come up on the primary care landscape and, you know, talk about some do's and don'ts and, you know, recommendations for uh, things that we get consulted on uh, pretty routinely. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so, so, so happy you're here. Um, so the first question I have, um, which is kind of the theme of this whole interview is like, maybe a place to start is like, what do you wish primary care providers knew um, in, in the context of urology? Okay. So I think there's like three general categories where uh, there might be some uh, not a knowledge gap, but something that would make it uh, a little more streamlined in terms of what gets sent to urology. So mm -hmm. the three areas are renal masses, uh, microscopic hematuria, and PSA screening. Okay, so I think I'll start with the renal masses. So we get a lot of consults on renal masses. You know, a lot of times they're incidentally discovered. Let's say somebody gets in a car accident or gets imaging for something else, and a renal mass shows up on. Uh, their CT scan or their ultrasound. And I get sent those patients a lot. And a lot of times I think that, you know, a lot of the prior the providers who are sending those patients over haven't looked at the patient's prior imaging to realize that that renal mass that we're being consulted on has been there for like 10 years. So <laughs> I get this consult, and it's like, oh yeah, you mean that one that you had back in 2009? Yeah, it's the same size, nothing to do. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's a common one. And I think that's an easy fix. You know, anytime you get imaging, uh, especially with a new mass, you know, just make sure it's actually new. Uh, take a look at the previous imaging and make sure it's stable. You know, we don't really get excited about renal masses until they hit three or four centimeters. Mm -hmm. And if it's been stable for years, then it's probably benign. So really nothing to do on that regard. So I do uh, think that's a good, easy thing to think about whenever you get a consult for renal masses. Um, and on the same vein, I guess I could also talk about kidney stones. Yes. Um, oh, yes. So, I forgot to mention that. Absolutely. There's so many questions about kidney stones. All the yeah. mat, all the gems and pearls, please. <laughs> yeah. So I think a, a basic principle about kidney stones is that, of course, you can have kidney stones that are actually just in the kidney, not obstructing, just kind of sitting there. And you can have kidney stones in the ureter, which are obstructing and obviously going to cause some symptoms. So I get a lot of consults on non-obstructing kidney stones. And if a person has a kidney stone that's just been sitting in their kidney and the same principle, it may have been there for years and years and it's just hanging out, no reason to consult. Mm -hmm. um, it gets a little more nuanced when the stone is large. Let's say it's bigger than one centimeter, then it's more reasonable to send the consult over. The reason is because a lot of times they're gonna require some treatment for that stone potentially in the future because they're more likely to become symptomatic or be a nidus for recurrence infections. So mm -hmm. that's one thing to kind of think about. But if it's like a three millimeters non-obstructing stone, it's just been sitting there, 
it came up incidentally on imaging. No reason to send it to urology because we're going to send it right back and be like, mm -hmm. yeah, he hasn't. Been so we fixed him. <laughs> yeah, that would be three hundred dollars, please. No, but uh, <laughs> uh, really nothing to do there. Um, with those stones, though, uh, it, it it I can get some of the rationale behind sending them because when you do a urinalysis, yeah, a person with shifting stone, there's usually going to be blood there, some microscopic hematuria. Um, but yeah. And I guess that's a good segue to the next thing, microscopic hematuria. Yes, 100%. <laughs> so, um, microscopic hematuria, you know, of course, like depending on how you're measuring it, you know, they have the dipstick, it'll say one plus, two plus, three plus, or trace. Mm -hmm. um, and we usually don't really get excited uh, anything below two plus. So if it's trace or one plus, that says something you say, mm -hmm. hey, let's retest it in like six weeks and see if the UA shows anything. If it's persistently positive or it's it's increased, then of course I think it's reasonable to send over a console. Mm -hmm. But if it's very trace amounts, no mm -hmm. reason to send that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially if it's in the setting of an infection or mm -hmm. um, they just started Plavix or mm -hmm. there's a clear etiology for what could cause a microscopic hematuria, you can delay that uh, uh, consult and just repeat a UA in like six weeks. And if it's still positive, then yeah, send it over. You know, we'll do the workup. For microscopic mm -hmm. hematuria, the workup uh, entails some, some type of upper tract imaging. So typically a CT, mm -hmm. a urogram. And it also entails um, a cystoscopy, mm -hmm. you know. And then a lot of times we'll do the workup. It's negative and we'll send them back. And mm -hmm. they may have persistent hematuria, yeah. but, you know, I wouldn't get too excited about it, but let's say two years down the road after the negative workup, if they still have it, then it's reasonable to say, okay, maybe you should talk to the urologist again. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we'll do a repeat workup. And then sometimes we're like, yeah, there's nothing. It's probably a renal cause, you know, because a lot of it can be renal cause. And some people are just going to have microscopic hematuria. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say first things first, make sure there's not another plausible explanation. And if it's trace or one plus, just repeat the UA in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't really have, um, you know, nothing's going on. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, I so appreciate that because I think like, I think, and I don't know if you experience this, experience this as a newer physician, but I remember, especially as a newer grad, I'd be like, there's microscopic hematuria. Like I need to like deal with this right now. And, yeah. um, and especially like in, con in the context of like BPH, cause that's pretty common, right? If with BPH, you can have that yeah. hematuria, especially if it's small amounts. And I'd be like, well, what do yeah. I do? Should I send, should I send them even though they have BPH? What if they have bladder cancer on top of it? Like I just got really in my head about it. Yeah, so it's like helpful course. to hear that from, from your perspective of like, it really is that time-based thing. Um, is there, and, and I had a lot of questions about um, the workup before sending for hematuria, because um, it sounds like imaging is a really big part of it, but also do you recommend like anything aside from your analysis? Do you do your cytologies? Like what is your, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, the most updated guidelines do not recommend cytology from microscopic hematuria. Mm -hmm. If they have growth, Area, then yeah, you go full tilt, which is the cytology, the CTU, and then referring for a cystoscopy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, different practices work differently. So I know a lot of people refer and they don't want to do the CTU before they refer because yeah, yeah, they yeah. want the urology and everything. Yeah. But, you know, some people will do the CTU before they send them to urology. That way, once they see the urologist, we just say, okay, we looked at your upper tract imaging mm -hmm. and we'll go do a cystoscopy. Now, sometimes obviously the upper tract imaging shows something really obvious, like a bladder mass or a huge stone or a bladder stone. So in those cases, it kind of streamlines the process because we're not going to do a cystoscopy on somebody who has a clear cause. We might just mm -hmm. schedule them for the for example. I'm sorry, um, what did you schedule them for what? Oh, for the OR. Oh, Especially oh, oh. yeah. The bladder mass. We'll just go straight to the OR. We're not going to go through the whole thing. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the big uh, delineation is microscopic hematuria is just imaging and cystoscopy. Mm -hmm. Gross hematuria is imaging, cystoscopy, and the cytology. Cool. Uh, that's the big difference. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think there's a ton of questions um, with most specialties too of like what, what um, imaging do we get first? because I like just for context for newer clinician listeners and, and viewers, like um, 
Like that's one of the discomforts people have is like, should I order this test that I don't really know how to interpret? <laughs> Cause I'm yeah. like, I don't do it all the time versus is it much more helpful to have the imaging? You go to the appointment and then they've saved so much time. Um, and that's my personal philosophy of practice. Like even like in primary care, it's like you're, you have to know all the specialties a little bit. Right. And so that's my philosophy typically with patients is like, Hey, we're going to do this imaging we'll see what the results are, but like, this is on, like, this is to help the urologist once we get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I have, I'm not bothered either way. I know our practice does work differently and people have different comfort levels, but yeah, yeah as long as the consult is indicated, yeah, if we have to order the imaging, we'll order the imaging. It's, it's not too much of a, a burden there. Um, but yeah, I think that's just a matter of, of how you're going to do it, how you're going to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a question. Uh, do you have any pet peeves of primary care <laughs> providers? <laughs> you can also I, take a pass if you don't want to answer. We're not going to come for you. <laughs> that's my segue into the next one, which is PSA screen. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 did we get to the third one? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I, um, I would say that's part of my pet peeve about consults. So I'll uh, I'm, I know that you know the guidelines are kind of fluctuating, but generally the guidelines say start PSA screening at 50 or at the uh, age of 10 years before the first degree relative had it. So for example, if their dad had it at 50, then the person will start screening at 40. And then the consensus is to stop at 70, or you know sometimes you have the discussion with the patient if they want to continue screening. So my pet peeve is when I get the 85-year-old patient who just has a PSA and the PSA is like sky high. And now I, we have to have this weird discussion mm. with this screening in the first place. And of course, they're nervous, you know, because they have a PSA. They might have a PSA of 20-something. And uh, now it's like, what do you want to do? Uh, are we going to biopsy you? Are we going to go that, that route? That route? You're going to need surgery. You're going to need radiation. And a lot of times, you know, you can convince them that, hey, you're 85, like prostate cancer is slow growing, probably not going to be have any clinical significance for 10 years. But a lot of times they don't want to hear that. They're like, oh, I need to do something. And, you know, these workups we do for prostate cancer are not benign, like prostate biopsy, you know, the, the, the side effects or the outcomes can be pretty deadly, especially if they get like an infection, for example, mm -hmm. the prostate infection is not a small thing. Um, and especially with an older person who has less of a reserve. Um, so, I think that I, I always uh, encourage uh, PCPs to just stick to the guidelines when it comes to PSA screening. I know it's obviously a little hard because, you know, a lot of times it's part of a big panel. So they're just doing the yearly physical and it's just a checklist. One of the checklists is a PSA. But mm -hmm. after 70, unless they're like a really healthy 70, you know, you, know, you have 70 year olds who are like super healthy, no mm -hmm. comorbidity. Yeah, you know, it's reasonable to keep screening them. Um, but if it's like a guy with thousand comorbidities and he probably is not going to have prostate cancer, probably low on the things that's probably going to kill him, uh, mm -hmm. I would not continue to screen them totally. because it does it does basically start this whole cascade of events mm -hmm. um, that you for the rest of their life when they could have just avoided that altogether. Totally. People had questions also about thresholds for PSA referrals. Um, do you have like any thoughts about that of like any abnormals come to see you? Or do we do a trend over time? Like, I feel like it's been so contentious with PSA back and forth over the years. No, I, I think it's reasonable just if, as long as it's elevated, you know, yeah. above four and over, because when you set it over, we have the discussion for the, sub, the subsequent discussion. We say, hey, your PSA is mildly elevated. Here are your options. We can do a biopsy and just go aggressive. We can do an MRI if you want to skip that and see if there's any lesions that are potentially amenable to biopsy, or we can just watch your PSA and repeat it again in like six months. Mm -hmm. And a lot of patients will opt for one of those three. So we can have that discussion. I don't mind mm -hmm. having that discussion with the patient because it is a more nuanced urology discussion, but mm -hmm. sending them over, fine. Just, I think you just use a lot of thresholds, you know, um, yeah. if it's four, then yeah, use four as your threshold and above four, just send them over. Um, sometimes though, you have to also, you can be prudent because let's say they've been like zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and all of a sudden they have a PSA of 20, you know, yeah. and then you got, okay, did you do something different or is something going on? Or is there a lab mm -hmm. error? So for example, patients who take up bike riding, um, mm -hmm. and they have perineal pressure, their PSA will be falsely elevated. Oh, wow. Or if they recently 
catheter placed, or if they recently had an infection, all of these can falsely elevate PSA. So sometimes I'll get these crazy consults and it's like, oh yeah, his PSA just jumped to 20. I think he's got metastatic prostate cancer and I'll just repeat the PSA and it's zero again. Um, because, so if there's a weird outlier, yeah. I'll be like, okay, that's kind of weird. I'll yeah. check it again, three months or, or something, yeah. uh, just to make sure it's not anything, or not, not, not even not long, you say like six weeks. And I mean, you know, if you send those, that's fine, but that's just something to keep in mm -hmm. mind, uh, especially if it's not making sense in your head as to why this PSA trend is off. But no, I think it's reasonable just to send the consult over and mm -hmm. we'll have that discussion of what they want to do next. Mm, I so appreciate you sharing that because like I think that I really want to highlight especially for newer clinicians adjusting that like um, we don't have to do it all and we don't in fact have the time and we don't have the nuanced knowledge to have those conversations whether it's NP or MD in primary care and I think that it's just really helpful to hear like what's on the other side like I think I'm just I'm such a nosy curious person to begin with that I just like want to hang out in all the specialties and like ooh, what happens you know so the fact that like that's what's going to happen when you get there when the patients get there like I can at least explain to them like this is the process to expect um even if I don't have the full nuanced conversation about PSA so it's cool yeah. so I have some other questions from people um so you kind of touched about stones um so you, you primarily, um, when it comes to kidney stones, I guess the question is people want to know about urology versus nephrology because I know there's bladder stones, there's ureter stones, there's kidney stones. Like what are your thoughts about your urology and nephrology from that perspective? Yeah. So nephrology is not going to do anything for your kidney stones. <laughs> so, you know. so just to clear up that myth there, just because it's in the kidneys, they don't own it. <laughs> Okay. Send, they're just going to send it to urology. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so like I said, I think the main major, major delineation you have to be concerned about is this an obstructing stone? And mm -hmm. of course, if it is, the patient will know. And that's something you send to urology, right? Uh, if it's a non obstructing stone, it's just in your kidney. Once again, the same principle with renal masses see if you can see any evidence of this stone on previous imaging, if it's available. Um, if you are going to do any type of stone workup where you have a question about a stone, don't order an ultrasound. I don't know how to read those for stones. They're not really helpful. A CT, a CT non-contrast is, is good. Uh, oh. That's another pet peeve when people order ultrasounds for stones because I always have to order a CT because mm. I feel like, you know, say, yeah, maybe you can see a stone. Recommend CD, CT. So it's like, you're just having, you're just doing for no reason, for no reason. Cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I think with kidney stones, just they're, you're, they're under your own these purview. And if they're obstructing or if they're really big, like I said, over one centimeter, reasonable to send it over. If it's a small little pump tape stone, and even if they're bilateral and they're not having any symptoms, no reason to, to send that because we're not going to do anything about it. There's no indication to go and clear out the stones in the kidney because oftentimes you'll do more harm than benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, the only would be if they're having recurrence infections, for example, or if they're having a lot of pain, because there are people who will have flank pain without an obstructing stone mm. um, when the stones are big. And sometimes it's like, okay, I've worked this person up and let's just send them to urology. And they're annoying consults, but we understand that, you know, you don't, you're really kind of pushed to that point. Yeah, um, totally. Do you have any guidance also about the ordering the CT urogram? Like any? Yeah, so. Usually uh, imaging centers have a protocol. So as long as you put CT urogram uh, or, you, or you put it in the con, because it's a, it's a, it's a, with IV contrast. So mm -hmm. let's say you don't have CT urogram. Mm -hmm. You can just put CT with IV contrast and then the com the comments, right? Urogram. Cool. The C imaging center should know what that entails. Okay. Uh, and like CT urogram would only be for hematuria workup. Yeah. If it's a stone, you can simply just put a CT non con. CT. Yeah. So, that's awesome. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the other questions we had. Um, I think a really big one is about, um, I think three big ones and you can, we can pick and choose depending on time, but, um, I think there's, uh, erectile dysfunction, BPH and, um, incontinence. I think there's a lot of questions. The main thing is like we have, you know, there's resources to consult about like how to best manage those. But then when it, I think there's questions a lot of people have with those, especially those conditions of like, at what point, 
yeah, like at what point when you find an enlarged prostate, if it's like a first diagnosis, is that something that the primary care provider should be managing versus do you refer to urology right away? Yeah, like I said, let's start with maybe enlarged prostate to start, um, and then we'll talk about the other topics. Yeah, so I think it depends on the initial presentation. So, right, there's a guy with enlarged prostate who's like, yeah, I'm having a little trouble with peeing and my stream's a little bit weaker. And then there's the guy who comes in with urinary retention and he's got like a thousand liters in his bladder. So obviously that second guy, that's a that should be an immediate referral to urology yeah. because his retention is going to need something more than just medical treatment. You can initiate medical treatment, but that person's going to be need to see my urology. See. The other guy who's like, yeah, I have a little trouble peeing and, you know, I want to try something. It's reasonable to start Flomax. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it has a normal side effect profile. You know, you basically just have to tell them, hey, take it at nighttime because it's going to make you kind of drowsy, potentially. And then um, you always have to let the men know about the retrograde ejaculation because it's always the number one thing. Oh, wow. Uh, no, I'm not, I was not aware. Thank you for telling us. So that one basically, because it relaxes the muscle of the prostate, that's what the ejaculatory ducts are as well. So some of the ejaculate is actually just going to dribble out mm -hmm. and some will go back to the bladder and then suddenly like, hey, what's going on? So you just let them know mm -hmm. that's a potential side effect. But aside from that, it's a pretty minimal side effect profile. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just start them and have them follow up in three months. Mm -hmm. And then if at three months, like, yeah, it works great. I'm like, all right, see you in a year uh, yeah. with regards to the issue. Um, you know, now there is the guy who, you, let's say you have a patient who's already been on Flomax, he's been on yeah. it for years, and he's like, yeah, I was working before, now it's not working too much. You know, uh, it's not necessarily FDA guidelines, but sometimes people just double up the dose, so you mm -hmm. can go some point, point eight. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in that, you can also just send them to urology, because at that point, yeah. we're going to have the discussion about, okay, listen, we can start you on a, we can increase your dose. We can add finasteride, yeah. or we can talk about minimally invasive treatment options. Mm -hmm. Because of course, people know about the TERP, which is the traditional way of relieving obstruction. But now there's so much more mm -hmm. uh, less procedures that patients can take, and they're catered towards these patients who are on medications but still not happy with where their symptoms are at. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially with the younger guys, they don't want to be put on finasteride, which is the other agent, because of the hormonal side effects, decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, things like that. Mm. Um, those guys, I'll see them like, yeah, I've been on Flomax for years and it's not really working. And, you know, I tried doubling up and it's still not really working. So I'll talk to those guys and say, like, okay, well, listen, we can give you surgery and that might actually get you medications all together. And we have all these new options available in addition to the traditional turf, which is still the gold standard. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I have a question about that too. Like when, when should we be more concerned about some sort of underlying prostate cancer when somebody is coming in for enlarged, enlarged prostate? So it's very uncommon to actually see that as a presentation um, because if you have an enlarged prostate, and it's secondary to cancer, that means your cancer is like very locally advanced. Mm -hmm. And they would typically have the back pain and their PSA would probably be sky high. But part of the initial workup for BPH is always to get a PSA, yeah. right? So um, if you get a PSA that's super high, then you're like, all right, well, I'm sending you to urology because there might be something else underlying this. Okay. But you know, if they come the first time and they have a large prostate with the PSA within normal limits, then it's fine. Cool. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And so I think there's a similar question about erectile dysfunction um, in terms of like workup versus treatment in primary care versus sending to urology. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. So I think there is a lot of uh, different philosophies because like some clinics just work different. Some clinics are like, listen, I don't have time to do ED, so I'm going to send you over. Yeah. Um, but, you know, simple, I mean, like I said, similar Viagra and Cialis, they both have a similar relatively mild side effect profile, you know, the headaches, the congestion, some of the color vision abnormalities, those mm -hmm. are all trans and usually they resolve where patients, you know, are not doing any of this. I think you just kind of, you can operate on the principle of, listen, I'm going to start you on the middle dose of two pills and you can go up to four mm -hmm. or not. And you go both ways. I mean, I get some patients who are coming for new ED a lot and it's like, whatever, I'll see them, but mm -hmm. it's not uh, wrong with seeing them in primary care. Mm. The part we do definitely refer them as if they've tried pill oral therapies already yeah. and they're like, hey, this is working. And then of course we'll talk to them about 
escalating medical therapies, like things like um, uh, ICI, like intracavernosal injections. Mm. Obviously, on the more invasive side, we can talk about surgeries like penile prosthesis. Mm. Um, and we can talk about adjunct tools like penile pumps or, or things like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I should have prefaced before we started recording that um, I also like using interviews to ask and also the whole channel to ask questions that I feel dumb asking, but if I feel dumb, then other people probably feel dumb too. So uh, I have a, I have a I, well, it's not necessarily a dumb question, but it's been a while since I've worked up erectile dysfunction. Do you, and also there's a lot of questions about um, using testosterone, like mm -hmm. checking for low testosterone and managing that. Is that something that is like, I know endocrine manages that. Is that something that you also manage in terms of the yep. hormonal? Yep. So urology or endocrine can manage like hypogonadism, yeah. you know, because typically yeah, testosterone can be part of the origin, original erectile dysfunction workup. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you come back low, you yeah. tell the patient, so just one reading, like the full test hypogonadism workup entails two testosterones. And you also test for some like central labs like FSH, LH, prolactin, mm -hmm. estrogen. Right, right. right. So, to see if you can delineate where the source of the hypogonadism is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, you know, if you're going to do a workup, the basic workup is just getting a testosterone, yeah. you know, and that's like at least a basic thing. But yeah, if, if they're going to be on testosterone replacement, uh, there's kind of two scenarios I see. So one scenario is that patient gets a testosterone drawn, it's low. After that initial low testosterone, they're sent to me and yeah. I basically take over. And then... Uh, there's the other scenario where patient cup gets initial low testosterone. They come to me, uh, I do the additional workup. They get started on testosterone replacement, and then they want to go back to their primary care yeah. because they're like, "Hey, I don't do the injections if they do, if they go that route myself." But yeah. it's also a lot of work for me to come to year. Yeah. So can my primary care do them? And yeah. it's basically just a standard dose. Patients do it at home, but some patients don't want to do it. Yeah. So in that scenario, they end up back there. And if they end up back there, then it's just a matter of monitoring the testosterone. And pretty much, you know, it's pretty simple. You just want the testosterone to be above 300. Um, you don't want to overshoot it too much. So if you're going in the thousands, you should probably just cut down their dose to the next lowest. Yeah. Um, and you're all in the hematocrit to make sure it doesn't get too high, because if it does get too high, then they'll either yeah. donate blood or phlebotomy or something like that, just to yeah. get, get some. Um, so yeah, you know, I think, it all depends on how your practice is structured. A lot of patients, they'll just stick with us for their yeah. testosterone replacement. Some will stick with their primary care and others still will go with endocrine. Totally. That's helpful. That's super helpful. Is there a cutoff for you? Um, uh, and again, like it's been such a long time with testosterone, low testosterone treatment for me and not many people, but um, what is the cutoff? Is there a guideline cutoff or a personal kind of like anecdotal cutoff for the hematocrit elevations? The guideline cutoff is 300. Okay. And it's total testosterone, just not so, you know, there's there's free testosterone, there's binded testosterone, all those don't matter. It's just the total testosterone is what you use yeah. and 300 is enough. And they basically standardize it to simplify things. Yeah. Um, so, oh, the hematocrit yeah. though, like the hematocrit and hemoglobin, is there a cutoff for that one? Just, you know, as long as it's not like above 55, I'd say, you cool. know, because the upper limit is like 54 or something. So yeah, anything cool. above 55. You know, cool. it's getting a little bit thick and you just want to let them know, hey, you might need to go donate some blood or something like that. <laughs> That's a pretty easy way to do it if they're if they're eligible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and money, so gonna, yeah. sorry, go ahead. I was just saying it's not gonna cost you money and you're helping somebody out. So totally, totally. Um, so I have a question about incontinence um and yeah. urinary frequency, especially in cis female patients. Do you like any thoughts, pearls, all the things, anything you want to say, I welcome it. Urology, as you can maybe can tell, urology is not a strong area for me. <laughs> so I have all the questions. That's not my urology, and sometimes that's hard for me. Uh, but uh, yeah, incontinence is, is a tough one because, you know, obviously, you know, first of all, you have to delineate what type of incontinence you're dealing with. So is it stress incontinence? You know, obviously the people who cough and laugh and leak and things like that. Is it over? Is it uh, uh, overactive bladder or urge incontinence? Those are people who just get the urge out of nowhere, can't make it to the bathroom in time. Is it a little bit of both, where you can have mm -hmm. mixed incontinence? 
And then, of course, in the rare case, you can have overflow incontinence where the person is in retention and they have so much in their bladder just leaking out. Mm. Um, so I'd say, obviously, urge incontinence and stress incontinence are what, and, and mixed are what we see more commonly. And I think especially when you're trying to figure out or parse out the symptoms, you have to ask the patient straight up, like, hey, listen, I can't treat anything. What's bothering you the most? Is it the stress or is it the urge? That's I what agree. we're going to focus on. Yes. So that's one thing you, you want to delineate. So urge is the one that's a lot com more common in women. And the first thing you do before thinking about all the pharmacological interventions is like, hey, let's, what do you, what's your daily fluid intake? So mm -hmm. do you drink a lot of caffeine? Do you drink a lot of carbonated beverages? Do you, do you drink a lot of citrusy things? Mm -hmm. Do you eat a lot of dark chocolates? Do you um, uh, eat a lot of spicy foods? These are all triggers for people who tend to have these overactive bladders. And you'll be surprised. You'll talk to a patient like, yeah, I drink like five cups of coffee a day. I drink two energy drinks. And I'm like, okay, stop. And I think you're going to improve it. And usually that's enough to be like, hey, yeah, I'm not urinating 12 times I'm a day weird. anymore. <laughs> I'm not, not throughout the night. I'm like, yeah, of course. Uh, the other thing is I always ask about their bowel habits um, mm -hmm. because you have a lot of patients who are extremely constipated and the rectum is in very close proximity to the bladder outlet. Mm -hmm. So if you're constipated, you're not into your bladder well. Mm -hmm. And if you're not into your bladder well, it's always going to feel like you have to pee all the time. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised. About them. And like, oh yeah, you know what? I don't actually, I really have a bowel movement like every three, four days. And I'm like, yeah, uh, that's not good. So uh, I usually just have them start on some kind of bowel regimen, like some Miralax and Colace. And yeah, a lot of times that helps as well. So once you always start with the behavioral stuff, mm -hmm. give them like a month or, you know, some people do diaries and things and you can do those, but I just find patients generally tend not to do them. Yeah. Unless it's like a very like studious patient, you know, them, you're like, okay, this person's going to do it. Otherwise, I'm just like, listen, just do this stuff. We'll check in in a month and see where you're at. Now, if after a month, you know, they've done all this stuff and they've actually like really done it and they're still having overactivity, um, then you can kind of, you know, you can say, listen, I'm going to send you to urology or listen, I'm going to start you on a basic anticholinergic mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or something. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, especially if you're an older patient, you can, kind of, you can get kind of complicated trying to choose an anticholinergic because yeah. there's always a fall risk. Yeah. So if you have any, just send them over to yeah. urology and yeah. kind of from there because at that point we might say okay maybe you need some upper tract imaging or maybe you need a cystoscopy and we'll kind of delineate the symptoms a little bit more and then be like okay well you're older so we'll start you on this anticholinergic agents or this one at this mm -hmm. dose so if it's if it gets there then you know just send them over but if it's like a younger person you're not concerned about fall risk oxybutin is always a reasonable first line to start with yeah and if that doesn't just send them over to urology, yeah. um, go from there. And of course you counsel them if you're gonna do an anticholinergic, you know, they're gonna get dry eyes, dry mouth, potential constipation, um, and there's a fall risk. And there's also a small risk of retention because it mm -hmm. can work too well. I see, I see, totally, totally. Um, and I was gonna ask you, um, how closely do you work with um, either urogynecology or pelvic floor therapists? Like, do you do you have much overlap with them or? How does that go? How does that work? Wouldn't say overlap, but let's say, for example, person has incontinence or uh, or a bulge, and they're diagnosed with prolapse. Mm. Um, then it's a urogynecologist because I don't do prolapse surgeries. Okay. There are some urologists who will take on them yeah. um, because a urologist is basically either a urologist who did that fellowship or a gynecologist who did that fellowship. So they okay. do repairs. So that's when I kind of interact with them when a patient has a prolapse in the setting of stress incontinence. Totally. Um, conversely, uh, with pelvic floor physical therapy, that's definitely for, I definitely send patients there, those patients who have dysfunctional voiding. So mm -hmm. those are patients who have a lot of this uh, pain during intercourse, mm -hmm. they can't seem to avoid. Um, and their, their symptoms are kind of like vague, but, you know, it's, it seems like there's some tightness down there. Yeah. Those are people I just said, pelvic floor PT. Um, yeah. So I think it's ever, you're never going to lose something by sending something to pelvic floor PT. Totally. Um, totally. You suspect that's what's going on. Definitely. 
Cool. So I guess um, one, two, two last follow up questions, uh, two last questions rather. So one is about um, recurrent uh, UTIs. Um, so I just, I did a, I recently just did a, an episode on the channel. If people haven't seen it yet, definitely can check that out. of like the foundational pieces about that, but like from, yeah, like just generally speaking, anything you want to share about that. I think there was questions, especially about recurrent UTIs in postmenopausal um, cis female patients. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I mean, you kind of alluding to the fact that after menopause, it is more common for cis female patients to get uh, recurrent infections. And if you think about the pathophysiology, what's going on, uh, essentially, of course, most infections are from E. coli derived from the GI system. And what happens is the GI system, the E. coli from there, traverse the vagina and make their way into the bladder and then they cause these infections. Mm -hmm. And normally that doesn't happen too frequently because your vaginal lining is thick and uh, mm -hmm. it's a good natural barrier. But of course with menopause and atrophic vaginitis, that barrier gets very thin, makes it easier for the bacteria to traverse. And then after you, get, you start getting into the cycle of recurrence infections. So almost every postmenopausal cis female patient I see gets started on vaginal estrogen. Mm -hmm. and I Hey, your use vaginal estrogen. Take a pea-sized amount, put it down in the vagina twice a week, mm -hmm. and then uh, you'll be surprised that that intervention alone definitely helps uh, decrease the frequency. Yeah. Sometimes the, it's a bit of trial and error. So, like, I'll start them on vaginal estrogen first, and then after we might add cranberry pills. Mm -hmm. You know, even though this conclusive personally in my practice, I found that people get good results. As you'll see a lot of patients be like, yeah, I'm drinking a bunch of cranberry juice. I'm like, yeah, that all the added sugar, I don't think it's worth it. Why don't you just take a cranberry pill, which is the equivalent of like 10 glasses of, of cranberry oh, juice. Yeah, totally. Um, and then sometimes they get started on <clears throat> other agents like uh, uh, blank, oh yeah, uh, D-mannose, for example, yeah. or sometimes, you know, in rare cases, I'll put them on low dose prophylactic antibiotics, but of course I'm not, a huge fan of that because of the risk of uh, resistance. And then sometimes they need a further workup, you know, especially let's say we've done all this stuff and they're still having these recurrent infections. We'll do some upper tract imaging. Sometimes we'll do a cystoscopy. And then in rare cases, we can find like a clear etiology. But yeah, I'd say definitely in postmenopausal cis female patients, um, definitely vaginal estrogen is, it's, is no harm. Even if they have a history of breast cancer or something, it's all, it's a, very local thing, so it's not going to cause systemic side effects. I know that sometimes people get scared of that. And I have patients who had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and they're still on vaginal estrogen. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the studies, there's not really a correlation there. It's safe to use. Um, you just count the patient about that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's it's simple, it's easy, it's twice a week, pea sized amount, and uh, patients are usually pretty uh, adherent to it. And then cranberry pills are available over the counter. So it's like, yeah, it's easy. You can add that. And totally. usually kind of a multimodal approach kind of helps get the infections under control. Totally. And I guess from my from my understanding of like the, the primary care part of recurrent UTIs, it's like it kind of this is in that episode, it's kind of as a recap, but like you're kind of we want to document that it's actually an infection. It's not just here, you have another cause. And then we yeah. want to think about um like if it's two or more in six months or three or more in a year, would you agree with that? It's like appropriate. Okay. And then the other yeah. piece is like, um, like it's like there's lifestyle interventions. Okay. I, I guess I talked about this in the thing, but basically like, as you already referenced, like cranberry juice is like not that effective. This, this is my understanding. So correct me where I'm wrong, but um, cranberry juice is like plus or minus. It's kind of anecdotal wiping front to brand, front to back. Also anecdotal. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, intercourse frequency as well as spermicide, those are kind of like evidence-based potential causes. But like, if you've inter, if like intercourse frequency, whatever, we're not necessarily gonna intervene on that unless it's like really uncomfortable for the patient. Um, but, and then spermicide use, but in terms of other things before we get to the referral place or before we get to, um, like, where do we go from there in terms of like, the imaging really doesn't happen until we've tried to intervene for a while, right? Like we don't have to do in imaging right, right away. What, what is your threshold for kind of imaging? Like how many, yeah. where, where's your- oh, Based on their history as well. So if they say, yeah, I've had a kidney stone like every year, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just image. I'm not gonna wait. 
But if you're kind of taking the history and there's nothing really that comes up as a red flag, you know, then I wouldn't image right away or anything like that. You know, you kind of focus on, uh, yeah, you know, like bowel habits, once again, those are, are important and come late. And keeping a regular bowel movements is because you sequester a bunch of stool in the rectum, and of course, it's going to be easier for it to make it yeah. migrate. So that's always an important thing. But you know, yeah, I think, and then hydration in general, that's yeah. always a huge thing too. But honestly, yeah, you know, if there's no red flags that come up, and you've kind of done, you know, basic history and physical, and you know, you've intervened where you can in terms of behavioral stuff, I think you just send them over and then. Yeah. Um, we can have that discussion, but to your point, make sure to actually recur UTIs. There's so much patients who come in like, yeah, I've had like 12 UTIs in a year or the last six months, and then we go and look, and there's not like a single positive culture. Um, 100%. You know, so culture proven UTIs, you know, because otherwise it's persistent dysuria, and you know, maybe now you're treading water into interstitial cystitis or something along those lines. So if that's the case, yeah, you can still send them over, but you know, this makes sure that the patient is aware of the fact that, you know, yeah, you don't have a UTI every time. Mm -hmm. Maybe something. Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, it's so much better. It's like not one culture I can find that was actually positive. They just kind of get kept getting treated empirically totally. and then they get sent to. Totally. Yeah, I was going to say, because like in real life, like two to three infections in a year, two and six months, three in a year, like most patients who come in with like recurrent UTIs are at that place of like 12 and you're like, okay. So I guess like one pearl to take away for, especially for newer clinicians is like, like, cause you know, the IDSA guidelines, at least before were like that you could treat them empirically without the culture, if you had the evidence. Right. And then like the next place is, is, is to get the culture. But if like, yeah, culture, please, it, please add a culture. It gets, it gets complicated. Like, especially if they're just always uncomfortable or always, yeah. you, know, you could, you know, because it's like, yeah, I don't know kind of what to do with this person because I always, I can treat them and they're always saying that they have some kind of baseline symptoms. Yeah, yeah maybe something deeper, maybe like an cystitis, or they may need further workup. So those yeah. ones, kind of reasonable, you know, even though it's like, oh, okay, well, here we go. But uh, yeah. yeah. Can I sneak in a question? So I, I won't, I won't keep you for too much longer, but um, uh, sneak in a question about interstitials, just, you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> interstitial cystitis <laughs> yeah so like just my understanding of interstitial cystitis is it's almost like a diagnosis of exclusion um and it's like considered like a general bladder irritation pain dysuria from not other causes that we can understand um my understanding is at least we're trying to reduce all those things that you were talking about of like um all the bladder irritants like the dark chocolate and the seltzers and stuff like that but do you have any other guidance like I, I it doesn't come up that often for me in primary care but I've seen it enough where patients are just really uncomfortable and like I've even seen patients where they're on pain medication for it like they're on like opiate pain medication for it so I don't know what are what is your experience with interstitial cystitis or if you have any guidance for us in primary care it's it's like the toughest thing to treat in my opinion because it's it's hard uh it's like a you know, so there's, there's all sorts of things, you know, some people do like um, uh, benzodiazepine suppositories or, mm -hmm. or opioid suppositories or, um, you know, all the all types of, you know, people have done silver nitrite treatments in the past and things mm -hmm. like that. The most, you know, there's not really too much, you know, because the thing is, yeah, you can avoid the bladder irritants and, and do all that. And a lot of patients, they find like a kind of happy medium. I have some patients on things like d manos or Urabel, and they see the scene that scene that works for them. But mm -hmm. there are other patients more invasive uh, management, and uh, um, a lot of times you can get what's called an IC cocktail injection. So we have like a cocktail of different. Um, the they vary, but basically it's like a couple of different things, including lidocaine and mm -hmm. and agents that are injected into the bladder at regular intervals. And sometimes that's what patients need to kind of control the symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, definitely, uh, you know, I, I, in residency, I saw it much more. I think that's definitely the way to go for these patients. There were like treatments where they put some of the stuff in the bladder and like shake it up and let that come out. Those don't really work. Mm -hmm. um, there's, that's where they'd hydro distend the bladder. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's basically IC cocktail injections. And a lot of times urogynecologists will do those mm -hmm. um, types of treatments. But yeah, those are, that, those are tough to treat. 
and you know all you do as all you can do as a primary care provider is at least get them to avoid the irritants and and see where they're at but yeah. if they're just refractory yeah just you know send them over and then you kind of take over in terms of figuring out what's the next step yeah. but that's challenging when I still send those patients out from time to time uh, yeah. to like more dedicated and I also refer those patients you know it's kind of it's kind of it sounds funny but I, I refer to think there's like a, a big IC community on TikTok and I've learned tons of stuff about Ooh. IC applied that and the patients have benefited from it so it's like it's one of those conditions it's chronic mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's multimodal it's not just a particular medication yeah. or yeah. having that support system and talking about different ideas and different ways of managing it. Totally, totally. Medical TikTok is wild. <laughs> like patients like coming in, yeah, with all of the things. So I don't spend too much time on TikTok, but I feel like I should based on all the things that I keep hearing patients. I, I just use it for, that's probably the only uh, medical indication I use it for, but that's it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little wild and some of the stuff's frustrating, uh, but yeah. uh, there are some, you know, when you sift through a lot of the garbage, there's actually some really good information there. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so last two questions. Um, what is your favorite part of being a urologist? Uh, my favorite part of being a urologist is... Or like, why do you love urology too? Like they could be the same. Yeah, I think urology is just like, you know, it's just wild. I mean, you see kind of everything. So I think I like the variety. I mean, you might see a kidney stone and do a stone surgery. And then the next day you'll see a, a renal mass and do a nephrectomy. And the next day you'll be doing relationship counseling with a couple who uh, are dealing with erectile dysfunction. And the next day you might be helping fertility treatments or things like oh, that. Cool. Fertility by doing a vasectomy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a spectrum of things and the patients are really cool and it's like all across the spectrum and you can do all types of procedures and you get clinic and you get the inpatients and you get the outpatient and all that so mm -hmm. I think I like urology for and uh, it's definitely the only place you can get away with a lot of uh, uh, inappropriate eggplant jokes Love it. <laughs> it seems like a really fun place I feel like yeah, I just feel like every um, social media person, medical social media person that is like the most fun is a urologist. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I, I, I'd i argue that's the same. It's a very self-selecting specialty. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't know. I had no idea. The medicine is not my, like renal is more my forte um, in terms yeah. of my, my natural gravitation. But I also just maybe don't, I just haven't had the experience of urology. Maybe that would be my thing, but. I'm <laughs> so fun. Um, so I'm going to stop myself from sneaking in more questions so we can honor your time. But um, my last question is about um, where can people follow you online? Well, would you um, like people to follow you online? I guess I should ask. <laughs> yeah, I feel you know, my the, the uh, number one place I guess I'm most active would be Instagram. Um, and you could definitely post my handle on the, cool. the comments with links to jacademic underscore md um, on instagram and you know it's basically a lot of my nonsense with occasional medical information slipped in there um but it's uh you know i think i just it gives me a chance to kind of interface with people and uh yeah i like to actually you know get some educational stuff in there from time to time but that's probably the main place and then i am on tiktok uh which is uh slowly burgeoning it's a uh, my TikTok is actually dickdoc underscore MD. So uh, replace the T with the D. Yeah. And, uh, underscore MD. I love it. You have one of my favorite social media accounts for real, for real, for real. Like, I love it so much. You're so funny. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is amazing. And um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. But yeah, any, actually, I didn't ask any other parting words you would like to share. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I think, you know, uh, it's really uh, great to see that you have uh, APPs and uh, PAs and MPs kind of trying to bridge that gap in terms, like you said, uh, school, clinic. And I think that uh, it definitely makes it easier for everybody involved when you kind of know when to refer, when to try to tackle it. And, you know, I think there's there's no shame in saying, hey, this is too much. Let me just send it over. 
mm -hmm. uh, because that is in the best interest of the patient. And I've definitely seen patients who have suffered to their detriment over a primary care provider just not wanting to refer it. Um, yeah. So if, or, you know, sometimes there's the idea that, hey, there's nothing more that can be done for this. And there definitely is, you know, it's hard to keep abreast with all the different specialties and all the new advances and things like that. So just don't hesitate, you know, uh, especially if it's just, you know, patients really frustrated and have a particular problem, you know, it wouldn't hurt to send yeah. a, a comment. And like, yeah, you know, sometimes we might gripe and moan, but we'll see the patient. And, you know, a lot of times uh, we're like, yeah, okay, they actually have a legit problem. Let's take care of it. Totally, totally. Well, thank you so much for saying that. Cause I think that, I think everybody in the real world MP community is very patient first, but like excellent patient care. And um, I think there is so much imposter syndrome though, as newer clinicians that it's like, oh my gosh, they're going to like hate me for sending this patient. And it's like, you know what? It really is about safety first, right? Like it's about the patients, about safety first. It's all good. So I appreciate you saying that. All the imposters. I, I sometimes wonder how I'm a urologist. <laughs> That's so true. Well, thank you so much. This is so awesome. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.